Yeah, make your own free cultural space. This is the fourth Future Logical Symposium on free cultural space here in Boomland, and thank you for being here. Um, the next speaker uh, is a man named Sobi Wing, and he's been part of festival culture for almost 20 years. Uh, he grew out of a dance collective. His, his impulse grew out of a dance collective inspired by Earth Dance and Moon Tribe and he formed his own collective, Tribal Harmonics. Um, he's in, uh, in festival culture, he's been important for um, dealing with the ritual sides of transmission, of, of movement in and out of spaces, moving in and out of festival space. And um, he, came, he came to that from dance culture and through workshops and organizing for solstice celebrations. So he, he um, is a master of the rites of passage, which he um, has maintains a, a traditional aspect, but also customizes and uh, designs. His concern really is with life transitions, and he's, he's connected, uh, and he lives in the unceded Salish territories, uh, which surround Vancouver although he inhabits Vancouver himself, but um, they were never taken by treaty, and so they are lands that can be reclaimed, and the struggle is going. But And uh, he tells me that there is a new uh, free cultural space beginning to em emerge at, on the Sunshine Coast, north of Vancouver, called Ruby Lake Resort. But um, again, as I said early on, free doesn't mean immediate access. Some of these things are really um, sensitive as they're organizing and they're not open right away so news of them is always welcome but approaching them is sometimes a little um, delicate and you have to the respect goes both ways but you've got to got to bear that in mind for some especially emerging emerging uh, places so so be wing thank you Greetings, everyone. Um, this is a deep honor um, to be here. This is my first time on European soil. I want to start off with giving respect to the ancestors of this land, the Lusitanos. Um, this, this area, uh, this was a little bit of research I did prior to coming here has been inhabited for I don't know how long, but much longer than I, I knew previously. Um, these were the uh, people that were present before Roman occupation. And uh, they, were, they were warriors who uh, fought uh, valiantly to defend their territory, which since then has been occupied also by uh, the Moors and uh, um, Knights Templar. It was interesting for me to go to Sintra just before coming here and seeing um, the royal gardens where a lot of symbolism of the, the different um, uh, occupations that have been a part of this region um, took place. Um, I think it's also interesting in light of the uh, focus of this year's festival on the, the feminine, the divine feminine, that this is a region that has a long history um, of goddess worship. So I think this, this part counts as what Terence McKenna might would call an archaic revival. And just the whole look and, and view of things when you walk around, there's a sense, you hear the words tribal. In this, in this uh, arena here, the liminal village, there's been talk about Gnosticism and uh, ritual. And these are all um, things that have, um, have played a role in, in my experience of the dance culture over the past uh, 20 years as well. Um, I'm going to give you just a really quick, this is a short talk, um, so I, I want to leave time for questions. Um, but I, I'm going to give you a little short synopsis of how I became interested in rites of passage, which I'm happy to see is 
featured three times in the, uh, the program in Boom Festival. Uh, there was a talk the other day about birth as a rite of passage. There was discussions in the uh, Sacred Fire area on rites of passage in council. So um, it's, it's a resonant concept, and, and how I got to it is kind of a niche thing. It's, uh, it came through the dance culture itself, as was mentioned. But before we, we go there, I want to just quickly, for those who don't know this term, rites of passage, um, this is an anthropological term coined by a Belgian named Arnold van Gennep. And he was, during this period of um, Age of Discovery, which I think Portugal was the one who coined that term, so people were circumnavigating the globe and discovering uh, lots of different um, cultural aspects. And one of the identifying um, things that was noticed by the ethnographers was that there were rituals being played out in cultures everywhere especially small-scale societies. And these rituals um, featured three uh, types um, featured here, the separation types of rituals, so leaving your current status, whatever it was, um, to enter a transition phase, which uh, I think is pertinent to where we are gathered here. It's also known as the liminal, which comes from the word um, threshold and uh, standing at the threshold. So it's a space where we are given sort of a blank slate and we can reinvent ourselves. We can reincorporate, which is the thir third phase, into a new identity, which can be recognized by the people that know us uh, when we return to our day-to-day -day life. Um, and uh, some of you may be familiar with Joseph Campbell, he, the mythologi uh, mythologian. He uh, looked at this rite of passage in terms of a heroic journey. How many people here feel like uh, they've experienced or are experiencing some sort of heroic journey in their life? Okay, so maybe that's why you're here. <laughs> and uh, this heroic journey is the backbone of all the great stories, myths, and uh, even in our, in our films from, uh, you know, Star Wars to Avatar, all of these kind of modern myths that we watch have this backbone of the hero's journey. That... Um, also pertains to this concept of initiation. So rites of passage is a term that gets used in uh, lots of ways con in contemporary society, often, you know, loosely just to determine or to, to note any kind of uh, first-time experiences. Um, sometimes they are negative experiences um, where uh, uh, rites of passage are, are in relation to initiations into crime, into gangs. Um, but in its, uh, in its definition that I'm bringing forward today, we're talking about rites of passage that do a few things that I think are really uh, important to consider. Um, for one thing, rites of passage were noted by the ethnographers to be the, w the place that you could see where societies were bonding and where kinship ties were being strengthened. So coming out of a rite of passage, you would find that if you were the initiate, you would feel more kinship with the group that you were with. So they would recognize you, you would recognize them as your tribe, your community. So that's something that, as my first time coming to Boom, I've also been experiencing that, and it maybe took a few days before I could feel like I was, I could really stand as a as a Boomer, um, and that's uh, something that I want to talk about in in light of the larger festival culture here today. Um, but 
one of the key things that will help uh, look into this further is this concept of communitas, which is another uh, aspect of liminality, that threshold, standing at the threshold. So this idea, uh, Victor Turner, who is also somebody who took the ideas of Arnold van Gennep, um, coined this term communitas, which is basically when uh, people experience the spirit of community. So when you experience that moment, like I'm a, boom, I'm a boomer from boomland, you've entered communitas. And this is something you might have experienced in your home cities or towns where you've experienced a sense of spirit and community. And it's something that ritual has an important role in solidifying. And over the course of, of um, my life on this planet, um, you know, I've experienced that in settings like rainbow gatherings and uh, full moon gatherings. It's significant that the boom falls on a, not just a full moon, but a super moon and a meteor shower. So tonight is going to be pretty epic. Um, but this is something that's an ancient rite of passage, the marking of, of, of transition of lunar cycles, of Earth cycles around the sun. How many people here have uh, celebrated a winter solstice or a sol uh, summer solstice? How many people have done that with all night dancing? Yeah. Yeah, so these are uh, our waypoints into or our, our ways of uh, accessing something that's, you know, perhaps uh, part of an ancient memory of how we gathered and how we stayed connected with the earth cycles and with each other in communitas. As was mentioned, um, I was part of, I was one of many people that was forming a dance collective in the, uh, the early 2000s. Some of our members actually went on to, um, so one of the things, so what we were do doing was we were providing education and activism and spirituality. Um, we were bringing ritual into our community gatherings. We actually would refrain from using the word party to describe our events. Um, because what we were doing was we, most of us were in our early 20s, we were really feeling like we were creating a new culture. Um, back then we were calling it things like neo-tribalism. Um, so we had this, this collective called Tribal Harmonics, which was just one of many uh, collectives that were surfacing all over. Um, uh, and we had a, a convergence at one point where we gathered in, in Los Angeles with other collectives. And it really showed us that we were creating a culture. Um, similarly with, um, you know, the Earth Dance um, gatherings, I became an organizer with Earth Dance for 13 years. And that was an interesting experiment in creating community gatherings that linked with a global community and we're helping us to transition into that. And uh, that's an ongoing thing. Um, and in this particular photo, um, this was the year where the theme was embracing all traditions. Um, so it was, it was a really um, interesting experiment to try to see how could we go about doing that. And I feel like this is a part of the, uh, the rite of passage that uh, we're going through as a festival culture is we have been uh, in absorbing all these cultural influences from around the world and translating it into some sort of synthesis that can be relevant to our con contemporary lives. Um, and another uh, more recent for me kind of exploration in that realm is how to approach that from an ethical standpoint, how to take uh, aspects from other cultures in a way that's in right relationship with those cultures. And I think that's, that's one of the learning curves of the festival culture at present. Throughout the talks that we've been hearing this week, um, I think there's been some interesting models of the potential future direction of, of festival cultures. And I think that will come 
particularly from some exploration of the, the ancient times. Um, one of those cultures that was mentioned was Eleusius, which was probably the greatest initiatory type of uh, festival culture that I know of on the planet. It was expected that if you were a, a, a citizen of Greece, that sometime in your lifetime, you would go to Eleusius and experience that rite and drink the kaikion. And none of that, uh, we have no understanding of what actually happened in there because it was a secret. And um, it, to reveal it would, would be the cause for being um, put to death. That level of secrecy, though, is also something that secret societies throughout time have done to protect their initiation rites from getting watered down, from being um, taken out of context. Um, but I think what's, what's important here is that it was a multi-generational type of uh, rite of passage, and it gave people a sense of what came after, the, um, after death which I think is something that um, rites of passage also is about in many ways. It's about the death of a previous state. And one of the biggest rites of passage outside of birth and marriage and many of the other larger rites is entry into death, which is something that our culture is uh, in many ways lacking in uh, maturity in, in approaching. It's one of the hallmarks of how we aren't so much of a mature civilization. But when I look at all of the, uh, the people in our culture, how, how we support each other with spaces like the cosmic hair, and how we uh, cultivate this idea of um, a, you know, a caring society uh, as boomers, I think this is kind of uh, ingredients that lend themselves towards creating resilient communities that are, are well versed at looking after each other at the time when we're about to transition into death, which on a spiritual level can, can enhance our journey on, on the road of our spiritual paths. As another approach to contemporary rites of passage, um, I take inspiration from astrology and uh, mark transits like the Jupiter returns, the Saturn return, the Uranus opposition, and I think these are ways into connecting not only to our personal um, life story, which is very collective in that sense, but also to our, our heritage as galactic citizens. Um, I'm going to just bookmark here because time is running short and just say that um, in order for us to evolve as a dance culture, we need to elevate the levels of discussion. Um, so far, that's been lacking, and um, I created this group. You can't see very well on Facebook, but it's, it's simply titled Dance and Festival Culture Discussion. And, uh, and another one which was just launched um, this past week is the, the Bloom uh, Global Festival Portal. Um, and we have Jeet K, who is also one of the founding members of Tribal Harmonics, um, who's here. and. Uh, if you see him around, you can ask him about that. But that'll be a place where, depending on the festival that you went to, you can join in dialogues about those particular festivals. Um, I think it's important also for uh, building outside of the festivals, in between the festivals. There's a need to maintain these kind of energy formations that we create at these larger festivals. And one recommendation that I would suggest as a way to uh, locate more gatherings and just to tune into um, a lot of information that can sustain your journey is uh, Reality Sandwich. Has anyone here heard of Reality Sandwich? Uh huh. So this is Conscious Convergences. Um, I'm one of the editors on here, so I'm always looking for examples of uh, Conscious Convergences to add on there. And the other one is Evolver Network which is a global network that's spreading to uh, create face-to-face -face interactions between people. And I've had the um, pleasure of collaborating with Evolver Sport Organizers, as we call ourselves, um, when I've traveled. And I will be doing so uh, next week in Amsterdam, connecting with a, a sport organizer there. 
Uh, and another uh, organization that I'm part of is Youth Passageways, which is supporting the youth around the world to find rites of passage for their entry into adulthood. And um, there's going to be resources available there for people who want to even be involved in that, that kind of work. Um, and also speaking to the global rite of passage, I think another way we, c we as a festival culture can support that transition is by tuning into the indigenous struggles, not just taking um, the example of the spiritual um, aspects of these traditions, but also looking at the political struggles that these, these cultures are facing. And I really appreciate that the Liminal Village had representat representatives from Papua New Guinea to speak last night as an example of the ways we can lend our support to their voice. So uh, this is just some food for thought for this Aquarius full moon that's building its energies right now. As we're going to dance tonight, maybe that will be a way to activate those, those intentions we have to, uh, to send out to the world. And um, thank you for listening, and I'd like to open for questions or comments. I would like to ask what you think to, of the ritual of transition from using the word peace to using the word justice? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think there is no peace without justice. Um, Earth dance is a dance for peace, and I've wrestled with this notion for a long time, because um, I felt like, as festival culture, there seemed to be an easy stepping into this notion of global peace but then to actually look at the average knowledge of what was going on in the world that um, counted as injustice was relatively low. You know, and you could see that in terms of attendance at workshops that related to social justice and that kind of thing. And for me, it's a, it's a place where growth needs to happen within dance culture. We need to understand the social justice aspect a lot, a lot more. It will take more time and um, yeah. willingness to go technical in many ways in a, in a fun environment, in a social environment. Um, I think people, most people feel, no, I'm not in work mode, I don't want to get too complicated. About it. But uh, we have to spend more time on this whenever we meet. There's a lot to learn. About uh, justice, I think there's, it's easier to fake peace than it is to fake justice. And if we go to justice, we will have peace. And if we make a shift of wording that is new and comes from the peace wording, we all will think further about justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's again that global transition from adolescence to maturity as a, as a human race. And, you know, in terms of free spaces, how can, how can any one of us be free? if there's still people that aren't free? Or how can any one of us be healed if there's still you know, so much suffering surrounding us and so much um, environmental destruction? So it's beginning to think as a planetary citizen. In your opinion, what is the initiation or rite of passage for boom here? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, I've been thinking about that throughout the week and I think that there, there's been a lot of evolution um, from my knowledge of the boom from the time it began to where it is now. Um, I think that with the, uh, the international kind of community that we have here, that is a huge opportunity um, that I think can be expanded on. And one of my, I don't know, futuristic kind of concepts is that uh, we as festival people whether it's boomers or outside of that, that we learn how to integrate as a planetary culture. And one of the, the big ways that I think would happen is if we could break through language barriers. So as a non-Portuguese, non-European language-based speaker, I mean, I know English is spoken, but quite a few times I felt like I, I was walled off by language. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. So that's kind of isolating, and when we speak of all, we're all one, I think that's one simple barrier we could overcome. Um, 
The other one is just as this is becoming a permanent autonomous zone in the future, um, perhaps this is a place where you know we could create space for um, more in-depth uh, rites of passage, you know, ceremonial grounds. I think it's great that we have a temescal at the far end, and that we have um, these places where you have to kind of go through a bit of process to join in. And uh, this is a concept I've had with festivals: is that you know, with these workshop spaces that uh, these are little initiation points. And maybe, you know, we could um, structure that as a way where, you know, if you attend a certain workshop, you get a little um, initiation marking, like a, a body paint kind of thing. And if you get enough of these symbols, you get access to a special zone of the festival that is only reserved for people that have received a certain level of initiation. Another uh, thought on that was uh, listening to the drug policy uh, talks yesterday. Wouldn't it be amazing if you know every boomer who came here uh, as part of their initiation took a, a training and um, volunteer duty as part of the cosmic care, so that before you you know you tried all the myriad um, substances that are out there, you had an, a working understanding of what those things were, how they worked, and how to support people around you when you see them um, not doing so well. So those are a few examples of um, some future ideas I see here. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for um, all the work that you've done in helping create this culture and um, your intention within it. Um, and then my question, uh, I was really drawn to you speaking about uh, the initiation from adolescent to adulthood. Do you think that there's uh, actually any point within someone's life that that initiation um, wouldn't necessarily be uh, good for them to go through? Say, you know, I'm 24, but could I still consider myself having enough adolescence that more and more initiations throughout my lifetime will help me perpetuate and, and everyone else into being more initiated into adulthood, I, I suppose, is my question, Dean. That's a good question. I think it's really pertinent to our, our dance culture, because if you look around, the majority of people, I'd say, are in that early 20s range um, and are, are experiencing this as a, you know, a bit of a rite of passage for themselves, and most of us, you know, not initiated into adulthood either. So um, I think that one thing, one thing I noticed for my life and for probably many people like me is that we've had to self-initiate. You know, we've had to go off to Peru, do ayahuasca ceremonies, or we'd have to, you know, do something on our own. But what's been missing in that, which I think um, is something I want to stress here, is the role of witness, is the role of people that care about you observing that you've gone through some kind of change. So if you're a first-time boomer, or doesn't matter, first time, if you go home, it might be something that you do is, you know, even when you're talking to people who didn't, didn't come with you to boom, you know, share something about that with them and notice how you feel afterwards. Because I think that act of being witnessed, it causes that incorporation, that integration to occur. And uh, in general, with youth rites of passage, this is something that, you know, goes without being observed, and and we we lack mentorship, we lack elders, <coughs> we lack uh, education around you know how how to navigate through sexuality and uh, and all the substances and alcohol that comes our way, and you know, the brain is not even fully formed until we're in our early twenties. So that's something to keep in mind. There is that you know we are still forming in our early 20s. You mentioned 24, that's the Jupiter return. It's every 12 years. So that's a time of expansion in people's lives. So I think you know, drawing attention to those astrological cycles is another window. But in general, I find that the, uh, the people in their early 20s are perhaps one of the most in need of rites of passage because they kind of skipped that part to get to adulthood and what could happen is you become a terminal adolescent and the the story of Pinocchio is one that comes to mind where you know he's on this journey to become a full human being as a puppet 
and he encounters these young boys who take him to a festival, carnival, and uh, they get drawn to their animal nature and become donkeys. But he manages to continue on and become, with the help of the Blue Fairy, uh, he, he becomes a full realized human being. And that's kind of what we have to do. We can't assume that we're human beings right away. We have to kind of earn that. This is something indigenous people look at. Um, you know, we, we don't just become human beings. We, we kind of have to demonstrate that we've, we've become that. And that's, that's what initiation is. It's becoming a human being. Just to pinpoint uh, about the website, you said Reality Sandwich is kind of frontier in this rite of passage movement. Am I understand it right? Well, they're about the, the new paradigm, emerging paradigm. Right. Yeah. And how will you call this new emerging paradigm? New paradigm? <laughs> 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 Planetary culture. Um, Labels, I don't know, I find they get really, uh, they box us in and, you know, it turns into marketing and I'm really wa wary of that. So I just think it's, you know, we're, we're moving into greater maturity and, and however we approach that. Any other? Hey, Sophie. Hey. Um, festival culture, in my experience, um, I would put fairly early in the hero journey. It's kind of like an awakening point for many people. But I wonder if you think it can really keep taking us further through our journey, or is there another kind of stage in evolution that will contribute to a more permanent and um, meaningful new culture in the world? And what will that look like? Thank you. That's a really good question. I, you know, I, um, 20 years into this, this culture, uh, Especially around 2012, you know, I really struggled with and I still struggle with feeling pretty jaded about, you know, the trajectory of the culture because I think I had set the bar pretty high, you know, um, especially I talked about, you know, being a part of a collective and trying to, you know, create change with these, these dance events and just seeing that it didn't, it didn't equal uh, a fully what I, what I determined to be the health of a community, like a resilient community. Like to me, health implies having a community too. So if we go through this festival culture and you know, we find ourselves on a Tuesday and we're real sick and we can't get a single person in our, in our Facebook network to come and bring us something to care for us, that's an indication that there's a gap there. So these are things that I look at is like the health of our, our, our self is determined by our linkage to community and that inv involves having a role within community, that involves um, supporting other people in their roles and creating these kind of, uh, and that's something that festival culture, I think it can give us a kickstart, but um, <coughs> you know, in my community, we've been trying to create something to as a, as a peer support network for people when they're in states of crisis, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual. And uh, we want to have it so that, you know, if any given time, any day, any time of the day, somebody feels like they need support, they can, they can access this network. And I can say it's just, it's, it, it's, it's something that's not a part of our, our, our mindset yet. And you know, I would love to see that people like us who go to these events would be able to, to make that happen wherever we are um, in our day-to-day -day lives, that you know, all of us, before we die, end up with a circle of support that is substantial. And that will be really the, the indicator whether we, we achieved, <coughs> achieved that or not. Um, as far as our spiritual growth, you know, I think we can use these places to, to grow, but um, I think for most people who, who want to really develop themselves seriously, they will maybe take the inspirations from what they may, may ex uh, witness here, but they'll have to maybe go into a more dedicated um, path with that, you know, if they really want to get in deep. 
and, and um, you know, for most of us too, I think we're disconnected from our, our ancestors and our ancestral traditions, and we're quick to look at the shopping mall of spirituality and the, uh, you know, the spiritual or the psychedelic capitalism <laughs> that's out there. Great term from Wolfgang earlier. Um, but you know, like, how can we connect, reconnect with our ancestry, and and you know, pick up the phone that our ancestors have been trying to call us, you know, since we were born, and and say, we're here, I'm here, I'm I'm here to receive your guidance, you know, and, and have that support from our ancestors. These are things that we can repair. I think there's only time for one more question. So um, here it is. Hi, uh, Martin from Denmark. Thanks for the talk. I have a question about psychedelic substances as uh, a means for for rite of passage. Uh, I think personally, I had the feeling of sort of a rite of passage when I was early twenties uh, with a friend. There was kind of we we had some acid and we kind of figured it out ourselves. Um, but it was kind of a transformative experience, and I've also been passing on the torch under kind of careful conditions a little bit since then. And I'm thinking if you have any uh, comments on on that uh, tool or vehicle for a rite of passage. Yeah, well, um, so I work at a place called the Urban Shaman, which sells uh, NPO botanicals, and uh, it's not the, the most perfect scenario. But one good thing about it is, you know, I think it was talked about the other day about it. You know, what would be a good approach to making uh, psychedelics available to people? Um, should there be a store where you can just get it? Um, in my case, I have the freedom to say to people, you know, I don't, I don't I'm not going to sell this to you because I feel like f just from the interaction, like I'm not feeling like they're a good candidate for that experience. And that's a bit of a, you know, I don't want to be elitist about that. But, you know, the fact that we're not really initiated into psychedelic culture, this is why, you know, I was talking about this idea around, you know, in the very least, maybe doing a training with the cosmic hair before you launch yourself, uh, or something like that. Um, a lot of the self-initiation that goes on with psychedelics and in, in party culture has, in, you know, it's a hit or miss thing. Sometimes it's been really positive. Other times I've watched people go off the deep end and, you know, the rise of ketamine in our culture, this does not really work for me in terms of the the rite of passage concept because it's, it really disconnects people from that sense of community unless you happen to be another ketamine user. Um, but you know, I recently had a friend shoot himself, you know, from you know the lack of sleep that he had from being a ketamine user. And there's just concerns I have as a festival culture if we're not looking at the danger signs around these kind of things. Um, I've also, you know, in order to really go seriously for me um, in depth with uh, with psychedelics, I've moved towards the medicine side, towards the sacramental use of plants, and I think it's a it's a really um, interesting contrast to look at, you know, recreational versus ceremonial use of plant medicines. There's they're, they're two worlds apart. And right now, I'm a member of uh, the Native American Church, having explored working with the Santo Daime and you know with Peruvian um, ayahuasca ceremonies. And for me, um, Native American Church is is really teaching me a lot in the sense that uh, it's a very disciplined ceremony. And one of the parts of it is um, um, I've been learning how to do the cedar. So the cedar is, is put on the fire whenever a mistake happens. And the idea is not to punish a person or whatever, it's actually to draw conscious awareness to your behavior. And it's about you know following a path, the peyote way is a path through life. And you're trying to stay on that path. You're trying to stay from falling off that path. So it's a reference point. The ceremony gives you that just doing random psychedelics at an event does not. There's, there's something that we could do, though, as a festival culture, is have a place where we can dialogue afterwards about what was our experience, so we can reintegrate that experience, which is part of that right to the passage, the reincorporation, the return. And I can tell you a good example of how that really had a monumental effect was um, the farm in Tennessee which has been noted as a place, the, the birthplace of uh, midwifery in modern times and many other things. 
That whole experiment started from people from Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, doing a Monday night session where they gathered en masse with a giant speaker and just took the microphone and shared with each other what they experienced on the weekend. And from that generated this whole thing of, we got to create this new culture. And they went and, and exodus over to Tennessee and created this whole community. So that's the kind of thing that can happen when we actually put our pieces together and say, this is what happened for me, this is what happened for me, and, uh, and build, build something out of those experiences. Because if those experiences just stay random experiences, then they're not actually landing and they're not actually helping create the, the fertile soil.